So hi and welcome everyone to the uh, the tenth uh, today centre seminar of the academic year. Those of you that are new to the seminars, we try and invite um, researchers and academics from across the globe to uh, present new and exciting work. Um, so today we are delighted to be joined uh, by our very own Dr. Mark Eastwood. He will be giving an update on um, the TI toolbox and the, uh, the TI Viz tool. So Mark is a research fellow at the TIA Centre, initially receiving a BA slash MSc in Natural Sciences, mainly focused on mathematical physics. From Cambridge University, he developed an interest in machine learning, which led him to complete a PhD at Bournemouth University. He spent time working in research positions at both Bournemouth and Coventry Universities, where his interests include deep learning and computer vision. At Warwick, he applies machine learning to tissue imaging, focusing on GNN approaches to breast cancer receptor status prediction, causal inference, and virtual tissue restaining. The title of Mark's talk today is TIA Viz, an open source visualization tool in TIA Toolbox. Uh, so yeah, Mark, thank you very much for agreeing to do this seminar. It's very nice, isn't it? Well, do I have the power to share? So I think this thing is working. Um, so hi, I'm Mark. I'm going to be talking today um, about a, a visualization tool that's been recently added um, into um, the TIA Center here's um, digital pathology toolbox, TIA toolbox. Um, so first of all, um, a bit of an overview of the talk. Um, I'm going to be talking, as I said, about um, a visualization tool added to Tier Toolbox. Tier Toolbox is um, is a package that's been contributed to by by the entire of the team here, all our, our wonderful people on the right here. Um, so, um, I'll first of all just go through a bit, bit of introduction and motivation um, to the addition to the toolbox, um, some implementation details and go through the sorts of things uh, we'd like to visualize, um, the, the capabilities and features that Tier, tool, tier Toolbox offers uh, to visualize these, um, and go through a few use cases and find a few conclusions. Um, so first of all, um, why is visualizing, visualization important? Um, when, when you're developing models, um, it, it's crucial that you have flexible open source visualization for every stage of the model development because you want to you want to be able to understand um, the annotations and the data that you're you're training on. You want to be able to see the annotations overlaid on the slides and explore explore those. And you want to be able to visualize um, also at intermediate stages of the model development. It's often the case that you can catch errors during model, model development that aren't necessarily um, obvious in the code, but that um, become obvious when you um, when you visualize various aspects of, of what the model is doing. Um, and obviously, once you're getting towards the end of your, your model development, um, you want to be able to explore explore and interpret the model output and um, correlate it with what you see on, on your whole slide image. And in collab collaboration and dissemination, it's obviously very important to allow others to quickly understand and, and very importantly critique your model predictions. Um, so <clears throat> the goals when, when designing this is essentially to design a tool which allows um, for quick and easy exploration of, of computational pathology models in as many different forms as possible um, and allow sort of inter interactive, intuitive um, visualization on whole slide images. And the focus for this tool is, is a little bit more on research um, and focused on allowing um, it to be um, usable in a in a web based um, interface so that it can be used for online demos or um, um, visualization on remote um, 
remote computing cells, for example. Um, <clears throat> so this this tool is available in Tier Toolbox, which, as I said, was is um, the Tier Centers toolbox for all things digital pathology. Um, this is an open source toolbox that's available. Um, it's this link. Um, so installation is fairly simple. You need a, a couple of requisites, mainly OpenSign and OpenJPEG, and then um, it can be installed um, simply with PIP or, or with Conda. Um, so a quick overview of, of Tier Toolbox in general. Um, so we can sort of fully demonstrated by some toolbox for computational pathology. Um, provides slide reading in, in many different formats. Um, patch extraction and prediction, stain normalization, stain augmentation, um, a variety of models and engines to run those models, um, which are implemented um, in PyTorch. Um, both for semantic um, segmentation, instant segmentation, and, and patch prediction. Um, it has um, modules for, for deep feature extraction. Um, and um, the re recent addition um, of a flexible uh, visualization tool um, to explore these models. Um, <clears throat> so, this tool is integrated into Tia Toolbox. Once you've installed Tia Toolbox, it's it's quite simple to launch it. You just um, start the interface using a command that looks a bit like this, um, where um, you just provide a path to a, a slides folder which contains all the slides you are wanting to visualize, uh, and a path to all of the, the overlays that you're interested in, in overlaying on those slides. Um, because the UI is, is browser based, you can actually re launch it on a re remote machine. So, if you're re doing research, for example, often you're using compute resources that are remote. Um, so, so long as you have Tier Toolbox installed on that machine, you can view things on your local machine. You can view slides and overlays that exist on a remote machine just using your local machine's web browser. Um, just by connecting to the machine and for um, reports that the visualization uses. Um, um, and once you launch it, you, you're greeted with a, a kind of interface that looks a bit like this. Um, you have um, your main view window um, on the left. Um, you have one of the elements over here to control the interface. Um, select slides, um, add to the overlays that are available for that slide uh, here, control um, the alpha if you, you want to kind of um, be able to see the underlying slide through your overlays. Um, it's got a bunch of UI elements to control various aspects of how the overlay is displayed. We'll talk a bit more on that in the later. Um, from the UI elements to run interactive model, um, we would control um, which, if, if your overlay has time classifications, um, it has some controls to, to allow you to individually turn those types on and off. Or exactly this. Uh, you also have UI elements to open an extra dual window um, and a bunch of um, widgets for the viewer, which allow you, for example, to save whatever image is in the main viewer, um, to draw um, little annotations on there, um, and, for example, to, to bring up a um, full screen version of the, the viewer if you, if you need to. Um, so, so a few implementation details. So this this is all built in Python. Um, it uses Tier Toolbox um, for a lot of its underlying stuff like annotation storage, WSI reading, and tile serving. And the interface itself is written in Bokeh, um, which is um, 
It's basically a Python library for creating web-based visualizations that um, uses JavaScript behind the scenes, but you don't actually um, you actually do the, the programming in Python. Um, so it uses an annotation store um, to basically manage the annotations if you're overlaying that annotations. And the tile server is a, a Flask-based server that's capable of serving tiles from WSIs or rendering from annotations, depending on, on what you're doing. So, um, so just a schematic overview of the thing. Um, have the, the bokeh, bokeh visualization UI here, uh, which has a bunch of UI elements that you can use um, to modify how the annotations or the overlays are shown. So controlling the colors that various things are colored by, filter by specific types, um, turn layers on and off, um, so on and so forth. Those are sent um, to a renderer, which, which basically controls how those things are displayed. Um, and the tile server uses those to, to generate tiles um, to render your requested overlay and the underlying tile uh, slide tiles and um, sends them to, to the um, visualization UI um, to be shown in the main viewer. Um, and then annotation overlays kind of controlled by this annotation store, uh, which um, you can import annotations from, for example, um, a DAT file with some tier toolbox algorithms output or from um, a standard GeoJSON, um, which um, quite a few different things um, save um, annotations as. Um, and depending on, on what you're trying to visualize here, that the tile server will kind of request um, the annotations for specific regions and in specific ways out of the annotation store. Um, so, so what is the annotation store? Um, this is the, the kind of main thing that manages um, how annotations are dealt with um, in this interior toolbox and in this UI. Um, so it's basically a Python wrapper around a bunch of annotations in um, SQL and Lite database. Um, an annotation is just a geometry paired with a bunch of properties where the properties are just all the things you're interested in about the annotation or um, cell or dwelling or whatever. Um, you know, it represents a variety of different things. Yeah, so you just have a geometry and a properties feature essentially. Um, so you have a bunch of these annotations in this UI store um, and you can query for those in various ways um, like for example, efficient, efficient spatial queries to get whatever annotations in a patch, or you can query for property values, or um, as we'll see here, um, more advanced querying where you can um, provide a filter string, which is essentially um, a Python expression, uh, which will get passed by something called um, domain specific language model into your toolbox. And that basically just turns that Python string into an SQL expression to query the store for annotations that match that expression. So for example, if your annotations have a property called probability, um, you have to from a model and it's giving a probability to all of these um, cell detections, for example, you can request, you can filter out for only those um, annotations which have probability printed in the client, for example, um, or more complicated queries like this. Um, those will be done. Um, so now to go on to what sort of things we can visualize with this UI and, and its capabilities are. First of all, like what, what sort of thing might be we want to visualize. Um, so in computational pathology, um, we have a wide variety of, of model types. Um, so 
They could be using a variety of different inputs, such as patches or graphs, or maybe even um, that's starting to emerge um, multimodal text and image um, models. Um, and they may also be giving a variety of different outputs, such as patch scores or node scores, the graphs, text, aggregated predictions. Um, and ideally, we want a tool that can visualize um, any of these, these modes um, in as flexible a way as possible, um, and even potentially mix them up um, to either compare different models or deal with more complex pipelines. For example, you might have some patches which you get clustered into a graph or, or something like that. Um, so just go to go through each of these kind of scenarios in a bit more detail. Um, a very common um, kind of pipeline in computational pathology is it's a patch-based pipeline, which is kind of used um, due to, to memory, memory limitations. Um, so you essentially you patch up the whole side image, um, you process each patch using some sort of feature extractor, um, potentially trained end-to-end -end with um, you then train a, a kind of patch predictor or scorer, potentially end-to-end -end with your extractor or your aggregator. Um, and then in the end, you, you kind of aggregate these patch outputs for, for your, um, potentially for your whole side level um, prediction. And so each patch might have a variety of things we'd like to visualize associated with them. It might have um, scores, probabilities, classifications. It might have um, attention weights. Um, or some other um, aggregation weight. Um, so, um, another common pipeline is is kind of segmentation tasks. Um, so it's quite common to want to segment various histological entities. They might be cells. They might be glands. Um, either just identify them with the time. And potentially also predict um, properties of them, like for example, the cell type. Uh, we might also want to, to segment larger tissue regions, like tumor region or a specific tissue type. Um, an example of this sort of thing could be a like hovernet, um, where you, you are taking a bunch of patches and you are eventually predicting um, a bunch of cell segmentations and um, type classification. Um, another um, common approach is, is graph-based pipelines. Um, they are quite a natural fit to many problems in digital pathology because they're well suited to modeling tissue as um, a spatial arrangement of, of entities such as lambs or, or cells. Um, so you typically in this sort of approach represent the tissue as a graph, which is a collection of vertices and edges, and then each node um, would be associated with a feature vector, which could describe, for example, cell morphology or deep features around um, that node um, or anything you are interested in, really. Um, and then you have a model which essentially builds those representations, representations by incorporating information from the from um, the connected um, kind of neighborhood around the nodes. It iteratively um, overlays. Um, for example, this is um, a graph isomorphism um, convolution. Um, essentially, just combines a central node. Um, with its nearby neighbors according to uh, the weight um, and then puts it through an NLP. Um, so TFS has kind of been designed um, to include features and capabilities to that aims to allow visualization of, of any of those kinds of model outputs that we've previously mentioned. Um, so annotations and segmentations, graphs, um, heat maps um, or feature maps of various sorts. Um, it allows 
simultaneous display of different types of overlays. So you can, for example, have um, a segmentation overlay with a graph overlay on top of it, um, or multiple different layers of of, um, of image overlays, for example. Um, it allows for dual linked windows to kind of do side by side comparisons, or just to kind of see an overlay next to the, the kind of the, the unoverlaid slide, um, and a variety of features to kind of explore the details of the model outputs um, and visualize them in various ways. And as I mentioned earlier, um, so it's got you, know, you, you can make um, online or even remote visualizations using this. Um, so to go over the sorts of things you can do um, with the, the sorts of models we've, we've just gone through. Um, so in the case of patch base output, if you store um, your patch output um, as annotations, you, you can then view any of the stored annotation properties just by selecting them in the UI. So for example, um, just using the same, the same overlay, we can um, view um, colored by a patch classification or just by changing um, the thing that that is colored by, we can instead view, uh, for example, by to the class probability or um, any other property that we have um, in that annotation store. Um, and if we are kind of curious about more details of any particular patch, we can just um, view those uh, with a double click. Um, so segmentations again, um, so in the viewer, you can actually toggle um, different types of um, segmentations on and off. If they have a type property, property um, you can call them by, by any, um, any property that exists um, in those annotations. Um, and you can try to provide it directly as an annotation store, or you can import it from, for example, your JSON, uh, which is basically just um, a, a standard representation where you have um, just essentially um, a bunch of coordinates and a bunch of properties. Um, so, just to give a um, so we also have um, graph based overlays. Um, so these can be overlaid in the viewer just by providing um, a JSON dictionary of node locations and edge connections, um, a bit similar in format. To, to that used in talk geometric. So it's basically just um, a JSON file which has these um, these specific entries, so an edge index to define the edges, coordinates to find where the nodes are, and then optionally some extra features um, that the nodes can be colored by. Um, and nodes and edge visibility can be independently toggled in the UI. Um, I have some some demos of the the kind of UI in action, but they don't seem to be playing. I'm not sure why that is, but um, looks like they're there with me. But that's how we start to go with the um, static ones. Um, so image overlays. Um, So it's basically a laser pointer for some reason. Um, this allows using that. Um, so we'll go quickly back to segmentation and just to, to kind of show um, a quick example of um, visualization of, of segmentation. So here we have glands colored by. Um, in this case, it's um, 
their contribution via um, as, as to explain to and an explainer to um, the slide classification. And here we can see we can instead just toggle on um, cells instead or um, change the colors. Um, so let's have a quick example of a, a graph base overlay here. We have um, an example of both a graph and an annotation overlay where we can see each annotation here uh, shows the patches that have been clustered into each um, graph load. Um, and here we have um, basically a visualization of um, the feature map output by a, a swing transformer um, on um, on the whole side image. So just showing how it's picking out different features for different sorts of tissue, essentially. Um, so yeah, in, the, in the case of image overlays, it's basically just if you have a pre-generated image or model output that um, exists to some sort of low resolution heat map, um, you can just provide it as a PNG or as a JPEG. Um, and it can be any res resolution so long as the aspect ratio matches the whole side image. And then it will be automatically kind of scaled to the size of the WSI using um, uh, and the module into your toolbox causes of the WSI user. Um, so it, the, um, the tool also allows for um, dual linked windows. So you can just split um, the window to view um, two instances side by side, and those instances can be um, overlaid independently upon. So you can have two different overlays on the, the two different windows to do model comparisons, uh, for example. And so these windows was then kind of zoomed and um, um, in, a, in a linked manner. Um, so here's just a, for example, attempts kind of where we have um, a visualization of two different predictions on each um, window, in this case, um, gene groups, which we'll talk about a little bit more in the um, use cases section coming up. And can you open different slides as well, or does it have to be the same slide? Um, you can open different slides, though, in, unless they're registered, that won't yeah. make a lot of sense, but you, you can do that for sure. Um, so, because um, this is built, as mentioned earlier, on the TO Toolbox annotation store, which has quite a powerful um, set of abilities for filtering annotations, um, you can actually um, do filtering in the UI, just uh, in this little filter widget here, um, just by entering the sort of um, expressions that we, we looked at earlier. So for, um, on the left here, we've got the, the kind of more filtered um, annotations. And then if we filter for um, a one with this specific feature, um, relatively high, and we notice that we actually filter out an awful lot of the um, the glands which are not contributing highly to the to the in this case abnormal prediction of of a, a full side image. <clears throat> um, and here again, if we if we add um, another feature filter, so it's just um, uh, requesting that both of these things be true. Um, we again filter out even more so we can see that these two features, for example, are very highly indicative of, um, of an abnormal gland. So this sort of thing is, is really kind of um, interpretability of, of models. Um, okay. So this feature should be put as a props and then why it can be like blend. Um, so that has to be because it's basically shorthand for um, looking in the properties dictionary. So whatever. Here to specify them. Yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah, whatever. Um, yeah. Whatever things exist in your properties dictionary. But you can use that on the same to do that. 
Um, it's basically just and yeah. Yeah, I mean, so it's it's just uh, Google here. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it provides the ability to to expect inspect elements in a bit more detail. So if you double click on an annotation, it will give you this kind of sortable pop up table um, of all of the properties that are stored in that annotation. Um, in the case of graphs which have been stored as features, you can hover over them and you'll get this little pop up to additional information about them as well. In this case, it's the, the top five most important features um, contributing to that glands um, prediction. Um, um, so as I said, this this tool, um, because it's it's kind of a web-based UI, it can be dockerized into um, a web-based demo um, to act as kind of either an online um, demo that you can share with collaborators or that you can put online as kind of a, um, a paired resource with a publication to allow people to to interactively explore whatever model you're discussing in your publication. Um, so in addition to simply li linking a demo, which will essentially just be a bunch of slides and a bunch of overlays that can be explored, uh, you can also provide links um, that will take you to a specific slide in that demo or even um, a specific window in that demo frame. So for example, a URL like this um, specifies slide and a window and it will take you directly to a specific region of the slide, uh, which is useful for us um, sharing specific regions with collaborators or bringing attention to them. In um, that's essentially determined by the, the window. Um, so obviously if you choose a smaller window, it will be more zoomed in because that Specified window will basically so that, take us that, that limits you know, that window will limit you most. Yeah. Yeah. It will, it will attempt to fit to fit that region or into the window essentially. Um so it also has some limited ability to to um run models interactively um in the UI in this will probably be expanded a bit in the future. Um, but it's it's definitely a useful thing to be able to run models within the UI. Um, at the moment, um, problem it can be run. So you can, for example, just draw a box around a, um, a relatively small region if you don't want it to take a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and then just use the, the kind of model um, UI element in the, um, in the visualization tool. Um, and select so hover next and run, and after a brief wait, you'll end up with um, hover next segmentations. Um, as I said, more models will likely be added. For example, new click um, has been um, running internally in, in here, though it's not available yet. And we also have the ability to select a region and send it with a prompt to a text image model, which we'll talk a little bit more about later uh, now. Um, so multimodal models are starting to kind of appear. Um, the, the obvious example um, of a generalist one is GPT Vision. And you can send it an image together with a prompt and ask questions about the image. Um, so you can actually um, do that in the tool as well. Uh, GPT Vision has been shown to have some capability in medical diagnosis in, in this um, kind of paper that introduced to GPT Vision. Um, so you have an ability in the UI um, to basically select a region um, and modify it potentially with the default prompt. Um, and you can also potentially add some preform annotations onto the um, region to be sent um, and ask about that thing. For example, what is a circle feature? 
Um, so um, just as a note, you need an open API key to be able to, to do this. Um, so just as an example, we've kind of drawn um, a freeform annotation around this following um, box. Um, where we click on the the run um, UI element after selecting TDT vision, you'll end up with a, a little pop up that looks something like this, which will give you the image that it's going to send to GPT vision and um, a default prompt which you can modify if you want to. Um, and once we send that, um, there's a little look, you'll, you'll end up with oops, um, with a whole bunch of text. Um, GPT vision telling you things about, um, about that image and, for example, um, referring to the annotated area that you provided, um, this, this thing that I circled, um, it's talking about here. Um, so that's a good question. Yeah. So that's really cool. So was it right? What it said? Um, so uh, that's why I'm going to discuss a little bit here. Um, so it gives answers which often seem sensible, but um, there's not been a whole lot of work to properly evaluate how how good um, that CPT vision is in this. Um, it's obviously not a, a all the specific model, so it's likely not to be amazing. Um, and it does occasionally kind of refuse to answer it. Might say something like, I'm not able to give medical advice. Um, so, so as far as computational pathology goes, um, this kind of model is still in its infancy. Um, GPT vision isn't a computational pathology specific model. And there is some initial work with pathology specific models that exists, um, but again, it's 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 very much in its infancy. But there's a lot of potential uh, for something like this um, done properly with a, a, a fine-trained version of GPT vision or or something similar on a large set of histological images with uh, reinforcement learning from pathologist feed, feedback, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I think that will, well, it's potentially it's just a, a cool thing at the moment. It's probably going to be um, a very, very powerful thing in the future uh, once the, um, once models are sufficient quality for pathology to be available. Um, so as a last thing, I'm just going to go to a few um, use cases where um, where uh, this, this um, visualization tool has been used. Um, so, so for the first one, um, it's a method called Iguana, which was developed by uh, Simon Graham from, um, from here at Loic. Um, um, and it's basically a model that builds um, an interpreter of your network for screening um, large bio, bio biopsies. So basically, Segments all of the cells and glands in the whole slide image with um, this um, specific multitask segmentation model that Simon also developed, um, and then constructs um, a gland graph, a graph, a gland graph uh, with a bunch of um, interpretable features that were developed kind of in alignment with pathologists to kind of express some of the things they look for in an image. Um, and then there's also um, TNN explain that's been used to, to kind of highlight which features are most important. Um, and the visualization tool allows you, for example, to simultaneously, simultaneously visualize um, the segmentations of all of those different things and the graph, um, and allows you to color by, in this case, for example, it's um, how highly that grant that gland um, is contributing to the abnormal diagnosis in this slide. Um, and that's kind of you can view that online um, through this URL. Um, it's basically an online demo to, to be paired with this, this paper here. Um, 
So I will uh, I will write down my lunch time and that I paid a lot um down to what the research idea that's developed um is a a model for gene expression prediction. So what you do is basically um group genes that are um that tend to have codependent expression into into groups and then try to predict these groups um from a whole side image um using um a patch based gnm um and the visualization tool allows for example to view the predictions in these patches of any of the 200 identified team groups as well as a, a few um, other things and do kind of side by side comparisons um of the expression of different gene groups, um, predicted expression of different gene groups on the slide. Um, and again, it's um, and there's a paper there. Um, it's also been used um, in some work that looks um, by, by Nisha that looks at um, adding social network analysis features to deep features um, on patches in colorectal cancer. Um, and then using a multiple instance learning, learning framework um, to make predictions based on those um, features. Um, and the visualization tool can be used to, to kind of visualize the, um, the patch instance scores in, in that MIL framework. Um, and finally, another, another use case is um, predicting mesothelioma on TMA cores, uh, basically. Um, don't graph cell graphs on TNA cores with um, features describing the morphology of the cells. Um, and you can use the visualization tool again to visualize the scores and um, the features that have gone into to that. Um, so finally, um, as a conclusion, um, so what we've added to tier toolbox is, is a versatile tool for visualizing um, model outputs. And um, it's especially useful in a research focused kind of Python based workflow. It's written in Python. So um, if it doesn't quite do what you need it to do, it's, it would be relatively easy to tweak it um, to add um, to add functionality to, to the stuff that's already there. Um, and it's basically um, it's a useful tool to add to um, some of the existing options out there for, um, for visualization um, model outputs and applications and so on and so forth. Um, some future work and things to improve. Um, there's still room for a bit of optimization when you have very, very many annotations, it can be a bit of slow initially, but it's you to find once um, the initial loading uh, is over. Um, and also plan to, to kind of have a wider range of models in there. Um, and yeah, I think we're going to see further reading this as a few minutes. Um, yeah. Um, so that's about it. Um, so any questions? So Mark, is, is there the ability that you can uh, annotate some region that you want the pathologist to see? So in some sense, the classifier is not um, definitely about and you want the pathologist to comment on them. So we can share, I uh, see so you could potentially use the um, and um, if you set this up in an online demo, you could just share um, a link to that region. Okay, there's some dodgy um, model behavior in this region. What do you think? Um, so, so yes, you could do that sort of thing. So, Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for a uh, great uh, and product. So, presented this one in big picture neatly a couple of weeks ago. And we were, we were really like that. Some people from site one, actually, CEO, came across and said, So, the best thing they noticed was I used Bookend for this. So, the question was, How did you use Bookend? 
So um, also there was a couple of other people that I think they use other two boxes about open C drug and it was just pure broken. Um let's this is uh yeah mm -hmm. and broken. Let's look at that. So is there any uh, uh, particular limitation with this approach? So I suppose so I and some some people notice that so you have a feature that um, uh, the multi view feature that you have in the toolbox. Mm -hmm. So I some people notice that it's very hard to implement with other toolboxes like open C driving, right? So it's an advantage for Bokeh, okay, but is there any disadvantages using uh, you know these tools rather than um, others? There's some potential disadvantages in that um, using bouquet you're limited to the um, the bouquet um, and the tile source viewer, um, which at the moment, for example, um, doesn't support um, it doesn't support some types of tiles, which would potentially allow you to. Um, speed up the visualization. Mm -hmm. um, it may be possible um, that those get added to make in the future, but there are some uh, there are some performance-based limitations to the developing. Yes. Um, I would say that's that's probably the main main one. Mm -hmm. really, the experience is the main the main limitation. Okay. Yeah. Um, but there are there are some things in in the pipeline that they are planning to do that will um, translate to some performance improvements for us. So so hopefully there's one which I think which can be fixed is um, the the legend. So it can be probably embedded in the annotation store or the dictionary, or it would be good if. You can specify the legend as well, like when you say slides forward and use this this legend. Um, so so by, no, by legend, I mean the colors. So, so currently, what happens? Oh, is so when so you go from one slide to another. Yeah, you, you can specify that in a in a, a config file if you want a uh, consistent um, okay. colors for types and um, cross all slides. Where is that? Um, oh, yeah. So um, you can find out more information about that in the, so the kind of tier toolbox documentation page for this, but it's essentially just a JSON file that you put in your overlays folder yeah. and it defines, um, it can define various things about how all of the overlays in that folder are displayed. For example, colors for specific types, um, initial property, default property to color by. Um, you can even specify um, like default windows um, for each slide if you want. Um, when you initially load a slide, you want it to focus on a specific window. Mm -hmm. For some reason, you can, you can specify that in there and, and, and a variety of other stuff. Um, again, I refer to the um, the tier to the box documentation page for this. Yeah, you need to be able to paste some specific, like by default, if there is like alphabetical order or something, which the, the tool uses to load it. Um, even, I mean, if someone is not specifying it, but for example, if you're using a color map chat, obviously if the first color map in this. You can even check, pick out the first one, second, third, and fourth based on the alphabetical order of the annotations. So that will kind of fix how it is being loaded by default uh, in a particular order rather than being random. Yeah, that's, that's probably some of the reasons. Yeah, yeah, because when you're talking to a pathologist and you load an image and there are, there are a set of colors and then they make up their mind that <coughs> this color is specific to this particular type cell and then you go over it. Image and then say, oh, no, this is not correct for them. You have to specify that no, the industry does change with the way. Yeah, you would probe that. So, really, I think yeah, that's a moment you'd, you'd, have, you'd have to specify that. Like so. Which can we, so we can actually do it in the alphabetical order? Um, but that would still 
That will not be random, at least. So it um, be, it, that would involve some other things in the code as well. Because if, if you don't have, if you don't have specific colors set in your adjacent compiler, the, the colors are actually generated mm -hmm. for for the the classes. So that's what I'm saying. That so even if you, you can just if you that randomness. Yes, that, that could be one thing you could do. Yeah, but, but for, for the moment, the solution to that. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing is that if we can it's... load it from the config file, if there's no config file, then we can just mm -hmm. set up set a, a default way of doing Yeah, it. yeah, it would be good to add um, an easier way of doing it. Can I ask another question? Do you think yeah. line? Um, thanks again. For the um, so I noticed something. So I might not know this. There might be a way of doing this. So it's really good in visualizing, you know, annotations in the snow talk. What if we want to also report some slide level information? Say, um, yeah. I do some analysis. You, you know what I mean, right? Yeah. So there, there is provision for that to some extent. Again, it's it's maybe not as smooth as it could be, mm -hmm. but if you have um, CSV, mm -hmm. um, which has uh, in one column um, the uh, one column which has the name of all the sides, and then a bunch of other columns with various predictions or um, ground truth labels or whatever. Yeah. Um, then, if that CSV is placed in the slides folder, then every time you look at a slide. Um, underneath the main view, the main you will see yeah. um, basically formatted in a little um, chunk of text all of the, the basically the, the, the row out of that yeah. table. That's, that's really that great. Slide. So that CSV should be in the in the slides for the yeah. What are the column headers? Do you need to specify the column headers or um, the column header for the um, a slide name needs to be a specific name, and I think it's just um, slide name, but the, the rest of the columns can be whatever we think um, we show them. I suppose that's good enough. Uh, but what if there's a need to like, visualize uh, graphs or plots as well? Do you think it would be possible in the future versions of uh, TLVs? Say like, uh, um, do you want to add a graph on cell composition? For example, do you think that would be possible? So you, so you, you, can, you, you can you can put graphs into the UI already. Oh no no no! But but oh, sorry, by graph I mean the plots. It's so just a oh. bar, the bar plot of cell distribution, different types of cell, mm -hmm. figure, whatever. Yeah, so we like beneath the so just. We had at one point um, a very kind of initial implementation mm -hmm. of that, which we can compare at the moment. It's, it's something that's kind of in our minds for having once we figure out a, a kind of user friendly way of doing it. Okay. Um, but yeah, that sort of thing yeah. could be done as a bit of a future. Good. Thank you. So, first of all, Mark, uh, just wanted to congratulate you on what you built. Just, just to give you a bit of background, we started actually building something else. And then we Mark actually very this out of that. So very well done. It's I think a very useful tool to be a very useful tool. So thanks for that. There's a is a bit of online for this now. Uh, um it is um there's an archive version of the paper points with some of the two bioinformatics application has been submitted. Um no, I'll be submitting to that submitted. The other question I had is you know, at one point, I think you also were having to make a web server where people could just drag draw the. Yeah, the again, we, we, have a, we have a prototype of that. Um, okay. That will hopefully be made available in the future or isn't quite mm -hmm. very accurate. Um, we will take a test of it to make sure it's done for another revision. It's okay. And that, that, that kind of web app will increase the and so on and so forth. So, yeah, it's fun. Any plans to like, just because like building thoughts or something? What what I would be thinking my kind given it an initial try is even in the whole Python. Have a small uh, window where you could 
for the menu by the community. As soon as the back and it just falls by the board of And you can ask, like, how many PTV cells are there in this and which were not, which have a Christian school less than that. Maybe that would try to fit in the whole support. So I don't know whether we plan to incorporate that, but uh, yeah, I guess it's it's um, something we kind of have in mind and maybe the implementation of this figure out again a good way of I guess that's that's even hard to try. It's not easy. Yeah. One last question. So does Bokeh allow you to interact or locate or transform the the one of the layers or not? Um it, you would have to do that on the the kind of the server side if you were dating that to a practice. Okay. You can't do it indirectly. Uh, yeah. You can't do it interactively. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Brilliant. Well, I think with that, we, if, have we got any last questions from anyone? No? So, okay. One final question then, Mark, is uh, so what would you say was the best feature that would most distinguish to add this from other visualization tools? It was going to go long. <laughs> you can't say that. <laughs> um, I, guess, I guess the main thing is um, being able to um, to make online demos. Um, and also, I think um, the flexibility of um, having those kind of annotations and graphs on there is quite cool as well, I think. Um, quite a few other tools don't support graphs particularly well. Um, so that's another. Can I add another one to that from, from my own experience? Um, it's really easy to install and work in as well. So, in comparison to other visualization tools, say, um, the, what is it, the one that we call the Sony? Is it Sonic? It's the mix. It's the mix, yeah. Kind of like one. They're really hard to install. Uh, to get it to get it work, it's really hard. But it's just simple. You install two toolbox and one line of code. But once the web, it got for you. Easy. Yeah, well, fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Mark, for a, a really great talk. Um, and thank you to everyone online and in person for joining the meeting. So our next meeting will be our next seminar will be on Monday, the fourth of March, at the same time, where we're joined online by Hakim Ben Karim from uh, Central Superlec in France. And Hakim will be giving a talk on multi multimodal customics, a unified and interpretable multitask deep learning framework for multimodal integrative data analysis in, on uh, in oncology. So thank you very much, Mark. Thanks for organizing.